Hi everyone, this is Alan McKay. Welcome to episode 131. I'm speaking with Thierry Lafontaine from Schoolism. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. All right. Welcome to episode 131. So this is going to be cool. Um, I'm going to try and keep this a little bit short. Um, I just got back from San Diego and uh, just yesterday and I'm off next week to speak in Paris. And uh, that's going to be at the IA Mag Masterclass on the 16th, I believe, of March. And uh, I'm going to be talking about branding, which obviously is a pretty important subject. And I know it's one that I have touched on in the podcast and a lot of people have gone crazy for. So I'm going to be diving into how to build your personal brand and to really start to build your name within the industry, uh, as well as taking a lot of actionable steps around that. So I'll see what I can do. Maybe I can make that a future episode. We can dive into that as well. That would be pretty awesome. By the way, if you want to check out the show notes, simply go to alanmckay.com slash 131. So 131 for episode 131. And you can check out all of the key takeaways, the quotes, everything else that's shared in this episode, as well as links to everything that we talk about. One thing before we get into this I'm really excited about is uh, we just finished construction on my sauna in my backyard. So this is something that was a bit of a project from the minute I moved up north from L.A., uh, I was always looking at every house that I looked at buying. I was like, okay, where is the sauna going to go? Something I talk about a lot is cold immersion. So doing ice baths and how effective that can be for getting more energy and just how much you can really change your life. Like I've actually noticed like by the last year, not really doing ice baths. Like I just feel like there's a happiness factor uh, that comes into this as well, uh, whether it's dopamine or in fact, it is dopamine. So I had to Google it. I'm like, I'm really curious now. So I just quickly jumped in and Googled it. So um, yeah, there actually is a lot of mood boosting neurotransmitters that happen when you do cold therapy or cold immersion. So uh, I've wanted to get like an ice bath and a sauna right next to each other and um, be able to do kind of like the Russian baths, like the hot and cold, uh, which again, like if you were in Finland, you would go into a sauna and uh, you would, uh, I spent a lot of time in Finland. So every, every hotel uh, has always got the sauna and wherever you go, it's like, have you been to the sauna? Um, so you always go in the, the sauna and then you would run out into the snow and jump in the water and just having the kind of extreme hot, extreme cold uh, fluctuations of sweating and, and blood circulation. Like there's so many benefits to it and you just feel amazing and way more awake and way more energetic. And um, I've talked a lot about that and I, I probably will do a follow up at some point. But for me, uh, the past year, I haven't been doing it and I have been doing it almost consistently. Sometimes even there have been a couple of years where every single day I was doing it every morning for 20 minutes, every night for 20 minutes, just cold therapy. And um, now I'm really looking forward to having the, the sauna so I can do hot and cold back to back. Uh, so, you know, if you guys are interested, hit me up. I'm, I'm happy to uh, dive more into this. I just don't know whether um, or how interested you are in this kind of stuff. But for me, I'm always looking for those hacks on how to get more energy. And um, there's nothing I've found to be more effective than this. And um, moving to Portland, I didn't get into it too much. I found that I didn't really have a place I could do cold immersion in terms of like actual water. Um, I could do cold showers. And uh, again, like I felt like the, the water here is extremely cold, but when it's just on the surface, you're not really getting like fully immersed in the cold. Um, it's just more painful than effective. So like having it like kind of um, on my face, my face would go numb. It would hurt <laughs> rather than just um, making me cold. So now I've got like a dedicated like cold plunge um, unit so I can kind of, you know, fully immerse like under water in freezing cold temperatures for 20 minutes after doing a sauna. So, uh, you know, it's just a bit of a, a side bit of information, but for me, I'm really excited for that because I have noticed by not doing that, like I, there's just something missing. And I think it's more because I've been 
prone to doing something that like makes me so happy, makes me so energetic. And by not having it, it's just kind of like had a few side effects, I guess. So I'm really interested to see how much I can make the most of this in the week that I've got before I go away again. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm so excited for that. So we're literally just uh, putting the finishing touches on that this tonight. And uh, yeah, so right after this, I might be jumping in some freezing cold water and enjoying that. So it's going to be really cool. So just a, a side note, but obviously um, I have talked about this before and I love uh, all the, the FUs and <laughs> angry people who've um, jumped on Facebook afterwards like, holy crap, that was freezing. I just did this because you recommended it. Never again, because um, it, it definitely <laughs> is a shock to the system. But um, that being said, you know, if you want to try it out and you haven't, uh, I definitely have talked about it in some previous episodes. I would love to do an episode about um, doing some kind of energy hacks and how to get more energy. If that's something that does interest you, then shoot me an email. Let me know. Um, finally, as I mentioned before, show notes, go to almckay.com slash 131. And if you want to get in my inner circle email list where I'm sharing a lot of free training tutorials and other great resources, including PDFs, eBooks, a lot of stuff that I'm building because a lot of it I don't do online. Like m most people aren't, aren't aware of this, but like I don't actually publish much online. I do almost every single week to my email list because I want to reward those who take action. So it's kind of like our little private club that we've got going on. And uh, at this point, we've got over 50,000 people in there. So uh, if you want to get in there, check it out, go to alamckay.com slash inside and jump in there. That being said, this episode, I'm speaking with Thierry Lafontaine from Schoolism. Now, this is going to be a really cool episode. I just interviewed Bobby Chu, uh, I think last episode, and I've got a follow-up episode to that pretty soon as well. However, uh, what I'm really excited about, I think that Bobby touched on this a little bit as well, but they have a pretty unique situation where they do a, essentially a very tight knit group will go in and stay at the schoolism house, which is such a really brilliant idea. I'm always talking about total immersion, being able to really immerse yourself in your learning and in how that is going to transform your skills your career, but also your mindsets in a lot of ways too, and really accelerate what you're doing. And I think that they take this to a whole new level because you are literally staying in a house with an instructor, which is Thierry, uh, in North Quebec in Canada. And while you're there, you're with a small team of people. It's very focused, very intimate, and just absorbing 24 hours a day, essentially, um, all of this knowledge and all these skills that Thierry is able to transfer over. So I really love the idea where it is such a intimate group of people uh, in terms of numbers, but also just the concentrated amount of time. You're totally in there. You're not going to school for a couple hours a day, uh, going through a bunch of exercises. You were literally living and breathing art. And I think that's such a cool idea. I really wanted to explore this. So this episode is going to be a lot of fun. Um, Thierry goes through everything from some of the other exercises they do, such as going on trains and doing kind of life drawing, like sketching uh, of people around, just kind of capturing those moments, um, as well as just a lot of ideas he has. He's such a really insightful guest to chat to, and Bobby was as well. So I think this is just a lot of fun to kind of dive into. The thing that I love the most about Thierry is that he actually came from being a sommelier or a wine expert as a career and deciding later in life to switch and pursue what he was really passionate about, which was art. And I thought this was really interesting because I've heard of lawyers and all these other kind of very different worlds, um, kind of changing careers over time. And I thought it was really brilliant to kind of get someone that's kind of from that world uh, and being able to transfer a lot of his knowledge over as he changed careers later in life. Um, I, I just thought it was such a brilliant kind of transition and such a fun one to kind of talk about as well. So we get into so much good stuff. I'm really excited for this episode. I'm really excited to see what you think about this as well. Finally, if you want to follow me on Instagram, uh, I've been experimenting a little bit on Instagram the past couple of weeks, and um, that is just using it as a chance to do some Instagram stories and, and post some videos, things like that. Um, I have changed my username recently and I'm probably gonna do this overall and it's for a mixture of reasons. Um, one is just to get consistency um, with my usernames across 
the board and I'm kind of working on that at the moment. The other thing is just because I've had a lot of people um, copying my profiles, especially on Facebook, it's really weird when you log into Facebook and you get tagged in photos of yourself and it's someone else's profile, which um, has happened a bunch of times. So uh, I'm just essentially trying to um, make things a little bit more obvious if you log into Facebook or Instagram or wherever and you see uh, multiple accounts that are not me that you can tell at least which one is me. Uh, and if you do see any that are looking a bit fishy, then yeah, please report them. It's again, so weird. Um, so that being said, uh, my Instagram account will be Alan McKay official, just again to make it that obvious. But uh, it'll also be listed in the show notes as well. But the main thing is that I've been really excited with just using it as a chance to um, kind of drop a few really quick videos. And I like the idea of just having 60 second videos that are so laser focused. So um, I've just been kind of using that as a chance to post a lot of content, uh, a lot of insight. I want to do some tutorials on Instagram too as an experiment soon. So I'm thinking about doing uh, ones that are very much to the point, just kind of hitting the critical bits of information on any given thing and then linking to the the full-blown lesson if um, that's something you want to pursue. So uh, yeah, it's definitely just a way to kind of condense down a lot of information very quickly. Um, so check out my Instagram. I'll leave a link in the show notes as well. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's just been a lot of fun just kind of messing around with that. The last, I guess, week and a half I've been posting pretty much every day, sometimes a couple of times a day. Um, and leading up over the next few weeks, once I get back from this event, I'm going to be doing a lot more social media. So YouTube is definitely going to become a big platform for me. It's something I've been leading up to for a while. I've had a YouTube account that I've just basically had neglected um, all this time, but I'm going to be resurrecting it and putting out a lot of career-driven content. That's one thing which I find kind of exciting at the moment is that um, the past couple of months, I have been getting a lot of emails uh, from people on my inner circle email list who may not be specifically in visual effects saying like, hey, I love all this content. Is there a way to not get all the 3D videos, but just get career stuff because I really want to, you know, build my brand or learn to negotiate or all the things we talk about in the podcast. Um, I want to be able to get the emails, PDFs and all the other things that I share via email without necessarily getting sent like all the heavy amounts of 3D visual effects to tra uh, training as well. So it's definitely um, something that I want to look into soon is I want to set things up where you can kind of choose what stuff that you want to get. So when you sign for the inner circle, which is free, just go to almckay.com slash inside and you can sign up there. But once you sign up, you can actually choose like, hey, I want to get everything or I'm only interested in more kind of bettering my career or I'm only interested in getting the 3D stuff. And that way I can kind of know what to send you and what not to send you because I want to be appreciative of your time and of your attention and only give you what it is that you specifically need at that time. And then later, if you want to change it up, you can. So that's going to happen pretty soon as well. I want to really kind of be able to laser focus on the, the things that are exactly what you need. So I'll have a system built around that as well. So lots of stuff coming up um, for now. Let's get into this episode. So this is Thierry Lafontaine from Schoolism. Thanks for taking time out to do this. And Thierry, if you want to quickly just introduce yourself. So uh, I'm a concept artist and a illustrator for a children's book. Um, the most special thing that I do is that I run the Schoolism House, which is uh, an amazing place where we host four artists and train them for 30 days. A completely immersive experience that is uh, very unique. That's awesome. That's really cool. And we were just talking about this a little bit ago, but um, yeah, I was saying like, do you want to mention how you first got started? Everyone has a bit of a, a different journey in the beginning, and it sounds like you had a, a few other journeys before you, you found yours. So um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So how I started making art is, uh, it's a long story. I always drew like everyone as a kid. Um, there's this amazing quote from Picasso that I love that says, uh, every, artist, every kid is an artist. The problem is to remain an artist as you grow up. So my mom was an architect and my dad uh, imports wine. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was always uh, markers, pens, pencil and paper laying around where I used to live when I was a kid. So uh, drawing was really easy for me. I was just grabbing stuff and draw all the time. I, I used to draw in school when I was a kid as well, but I never 
really knew you could do uh, art as a job. I love cartoon, but to me, uh, Bugs Bunny and stuff has so much personality that for me, they were uh, a real person as opposed mm -hmm. to someone drawing it. That you mimic, yeah. Well, I was jumping to say that I think maybe Picasso should have said that, um, you know, every kid is an artist, but the, the tricky challenge is to remain a kid as you grow up. <laughs> exactly. He's got another amazing quote that said it, it took him three years to learn to paint like Raphael and a lifetime to learn to draw and paint back like a kid. I like that. That's really cool. So, sorry, uh, but you were saying about Bugs Bunny? Yeah. Uh, to me, this whole animation art thing, it wasn't made by artists. It was just real characters because it's so well done. So I never thought that could be a job option for me. And when I was in high school, they asked me to choose a job when I was 16 years old. And I was like, I want to be a jet fighter pilot. And then they were like, oh, you're wearing glasses. You cannot do that kind of <laughs> job. And I was like, I thought that was way too young to choose a job. Like I, I like to learn stuff. And I, I thought I was at 16, I was too young to know what I wanted to do. So what I ended up doing at school, I didn't study art in high school, in high school because uh, in my high school, it was just classes to take it easy. So I did that math, science, physics, chemistry. And then when it was time to get to college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I studied science because it was the hardest thing to do. <laughs> and after that, I could just uh, go in any other program that I wanted. So just to stop for a second and say, um, so you specifically chose that one because you knew it would probably open up the most doors by taking the more challenging one it meant that everything else is kind of like going to fit in that category if you want to do other things later on. Absolutely. That I like was, that. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And by doing this after that, I could uh, switch in any other program and I would already kind of exceed the standards to get in. Cool. Yeah. I like that. I think um, if anything, it's, it's kind of like, okay, I'll take the, the harder path now because it'll, um, be the path of least resistance later. It means that all the doors are open and I can figure out what I want to do later rather than realizing, oh, hey, I wanted to do this, but I only kind of set my standard to a certain degree. So I think that's, that's great. Absolutely. That's exactly what I did. And I used to play American football. I played for eight years, but I didn't know what I wanted to do at all at that point. I was just kind of uh, exploring life. And after science, which I didn't really like, I went and studied films. I had a friend studying films. So I went to do a film class in college and I learned a bunch of cool stuff about films. And after that, I didn't know what I wanted to do. But my real passion at that point was I love learning. And once someone asked me if you could be a millionaire and do whatever you want and you didn't need to work, what would you do? And I was thinking I would just probably learn different things for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. But at that point, uh, after I finished studying films, I didn't know what to do, but I wanted to learn more. So I did a wine class because my dad uh, imports wine and I had a summer job in a wine store. I was a wine advisor and I never knew what people uh, what to answer people when they asked me questions about wine. And my dad wasn't that industry so i studied wine i did a sommelier class which was an awesome class i learned a lot of stuff and i, I would want to do that just to brag about it later like i'm a sommelier and uh, i know everything about anything to do with wine <laughs> i think that is, that's a good life skill to have it is an awesome skill and it's very useful and i love wine so when i go to the store i know um what to choose <laughs> <laughs> You're, you're a good person. Uh, I, uh, I can call if uh, whenever I'm buying a client a bottle of wine and need to know uh, the right one to pick. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, my, I met a lot of artists. A lot of people making wine is like, uh, it's a piece of art. It's, it's uh, the, my dad's friend that makes wine. They're all real artists, just like painters and sculptures. So um, after I studied wine, I, I worked with my dad a little bit. I did all sorts of stuff. But what I really like is to study things. And after a few months, I always used to want to change and study something else. There's nothing I wanted to commit to for my entire life. So after studying wine, I wanted to study more, but I didn't know what. And I used to do some uh, capoeira, which is a Brazilian martial art. 
And mm -hmm. next door, there was a comic book class. And uh, I was like, you know what? I'm going to just, um, I'm going to take this class until I figure out what I want to study next. Because I always like to draw, but I, I could never draw hands or a face. It was mm. just a hobby. But when I was, all this time that I was in college, I used to draw all sorts of stuff over my desk, but I couldn't really draw. So it was mainly letters, but I had a hard time studying because uh, as soon as I had a pen or a pencil on my hand and some paper, I was just drawing stuff in class and at night when I was trying to study. So when I did that comic book class, uh, my teacher was talking about this prodigy student that he had that went to Sheridan. And um, for him, it was the hardest school to get in. Mm -hmm. It was uh, very hard to get in animation. And uh, I was like, you know what? I like art. And my teacher was telling me, you know what? You, you could do that for a living. And the first time he told me that, uh, I laughed. Because in my head, I was like, there's no people doing that stuff for it's not a real life. career yeah <laughs> yeah and now when i think about it you know i got a there's a bottle of wine with a label it's done by an artist the chairs my table the windows like everything has been designed by artists when i think about it but we mm -hmm. all take this stuff for granted well so, I'll, I'll just jump in and say that um like it's kind of mind-blowing now but like one of the the really popular things i've seen it several times now is doing like wine labels as like augmented reality. And even uh, a good friend of mine, he was doing that as a way to give clients or do an introductory to uh, potential clients was to send them uh, bottles of wine where you would need to, you know, put in the QR code and wear some, <laughs> you know, wear some goggles to be able to see the label come to life. But like, yeah, I mean, there, there's so much you can do and build upon and of like whatever was traditional 20 years ago and, and how to revamp that into a whole new genre now. And yeah, it's, it's amazing to, uh, to kind of see all that happen. Yeah, it's, uh, I saw the, some business cards like that. It was awesome. I didn't know that there was some wine labels like that. Yeah, I've seen a few now because my friend told me about one uh, about six months ago. And I, th I was like, oh, that's a really cool idea. And um, since then, though, I've seen a few people doing it it's kind of creepy to watch like a bottle of wine with let's say the person on it start to animate and move around <laughs> but again it's just genius to see how you can apply all of this yeah that's really cool cool but yeah so um yeah keep going sorry i keep jumping in no no problem um so when i applied to sheridan i got uh, the grade they gave me on the portfolio was 10 out of 100 so it was really really low and um i thought you know, I choose, uh, in my life, I, I did science because it was the hardest. I heard Sheridan was the hardest school to get in. And I was like, I'm not going to give up because I just get 10 out of 100 on the portfolio. So they, they suggest me to do this, um, this course art called Art Fundamentals uh, to kind of get a, big, a stronger foundation to apply again for animation. And my uh, comic book teacher told me that it was the most, the most important thing to focus on was life drawing, which mm -hmm. when I did the, for, the portfolio, I had no idea what they were talking about. It was like a three minute pose. And I was like, how are they going to know how long I'm going to draw this for? So it was a total failure when I applied that. And then uh, I went to Sheridan for art fundamentals. And I I kind of forgot that my teacher told me that life drawing was the most interesting, which is a drawing with a model. Mm -hmm. And I remember my first life drawing class was a really big shock because I went to a, my first language is French. Yep. Um, and I went to college uh, in Toronto without really speaking English, just with the few uh, English that we learn in school. And um, so when I went there, it was also to learn to speak English. And what I, I didn't know if I wanted to be an animator, but I knew I wanted to draw and do art. And that was what I wanted to do at this point in my life. And I saw the best artists were coming out of there and uh, I wanted to draw like those people. So the first time I, I did a live drawing class, I remember everyone was in a sitting behind easel in a circle in the class and i thought it was a weird setup and but i was really nervous because i didn't speak english and i could barely understand what the teacher were saying so i was trying really hard to understand and that's what i was focusing on 
And then I'm not this a guy wearing a wardrobe in the corner of the class. And I, I was like, what? But I wasn't really paying attention to that because I was trying to understand uh, a foreign language. And all of a sudden, the guy took his wardrobe off in the middle of the class and he was completely naked. And I was like, oh my God, what's happening? And everyone were acting like normal, a little bit mm -hmm. uncomfortable. And then I realized that that was what the like drawing class was. But that was a, a big shock. And then I remember- <laughs> If you don't know what it is, yeah. I think it'd be a bit like, wait, <laughs> if you got the right room? <laughs> yeah. It's like, what is this? And um, I remember then that my teacher told me that it was the most important thing, uh, the live drawing classes. And my school was offering live drawing classes uh, every night in three, four different rooms that we had access to for free. So I started to go there like every night. I used to go uh, six, seven times a week for three hours a time. So I was doing an extra about 20 hours of live drawing a week. And I really enjoyed it. And I start to get better and better. And then I started helping my classmates um, with, in live drawing. And then I was a very, very rational person. I needed to understand exactly why I'm doing everything. And so I needed, when I learned something in live drawing, when my teacher were telling me stuff, and I used to get tutors from the school, I used to get all the best live drawer and of the school to tutor me and every time someone was teaching me I was trying to understand exactly why I was doing it so after you totally understand what you're doing it's easy to explain it to people mm -hmm. so I, as I start helping my classmates people were telling me that they really love how I explain stuff and it was very clear and really easy and that's how I started teaching and uh, I met Bobby Chu in school, he was one of my tutors, and I met Kay Asadera as well at school. She was my classmate. And um, you start meeting all the hardworking students because the when you stay at school after to do some life drawing and some work, that's where you meet, you start to see familiar face of people that stay there all the time to work hard. Mm. And um, that's how I met Bobby and Kay. And cool. um after that well just to jump on. sorry to jump in just real quick but um i'm just curious so like with you finding bobby and all all these other tutors uh, as you mentioned like finding the best tutors around you was that something that was easy to do or did you have to really seek them out and um and try to get uh, these people on board for you like what what typically well, would you need to do to get those people on board that's a really good question so um the school had a tutoring kind of program in place that was wonderful for example let's say you got problem in maths and you could get you could go to the career center and they would get you a third year math students to help you with your math so basically you used to pay the school uh ten dollar uh twenty dollar for ten hours so it costs you two dollar an hour and the school used to pay the tutor ten dollar an hour so it was a wonderful thing that the school was doing. So I went there to uh, get a tutor for live drawing. And then it's good because for me, it just cost me $2 an hour. And the students that tutors me gets $10 an hour. And then I thought it was a wonderful program. But the school assigned you a tutor. So I got a few tutors assigned to me. And uh, I thought it was wonderful. And then I started tracking the best live drawer in the school. And if they weren't registered with that program, I was telling them like, hey, you can make $10 an hour to like help me. Mm -hmm. And then they used to go register for that program. And I used to have two, three, four tutors at the same time sometimes. And uh, that was my uh, passion to, uh, to track people and to figure out uh, we were the best live drawer and to get them to tutor me. I like and that because you're, you're essentially recruiting people into, uh, you know, <laughs> doing this educating, but for your benefit. But I, I think it's, it's kind of, we'll get to later on uh, what schoolism is doing and how you guys do a really immersive training at your house. But I think in a way that's kind of the roots there as well, where um, you're, you're basically having all these people immerse themselves in you and having multiple people, the best people all training you and, and being a sponge for that knowledge. I think that's, that's really cool. 
Yeah, that was the kind of core of what I wanted to do. And uh, it starts slowly with this. And um, I was, I didn't have a lot of money when I was in school. You could always teach them French. <laughs> or Quebec French, French anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I, when I got better, when I got second and third year, I started, um, I had tutors, but also I started being a tutor for other people. And that's what pretty much how I could eat <laughs> mm -hmm. through that tutoring program. And uh, that's how I met Bobby Chu as well. Um, he used to be that student that graduated already from the program. And he used to still come at live drawing at night. And uh, I saw him come and uh, teach my tutors. And I was like, who's this guy? Like, I need this guy to tutor me. But uh, I asked him many times and he wasn't interested. And um, sometimes I used to go to live drawing like two times in the day, do that six hours a day. And one day I had a really good live drawing day and I saw it was a Friday night. Everyone was partying. Uh, the live drawing room was almost empty, but I was there. Bobby was there. And I used to ask him in the break to help me. And um, sometimes it felt like uh, uh, I was... Uh, not inappropriate, but it bugged him a little bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, I knew he was sneaking in the live drawing room, and I thought maybe he felt a little guilty. So <laughs> helping people kind of pay back for that a little bit. But, you know, I really wanted to learn, and I knew what I wanted. And I kept asking him stuff once in a while. And one day he told me, you know what, you, do you still want to get tutored by me? And I was like, yes. And then he became my tutor. And after a while, uh, we became friends. And uh, like I said before, I didn't have a lot of money. And uh, sometimes uh, I used to, Bobby wasn't going to the school anymore. So he wasn't through that tutoring program. So I used to pay him from my own pocket. And um, at some point, I think he heard that I, I used to pay him for tutoring instead of eating. <laughs> <laughs> Because to me, uh, it was more important to learn than to eat. And uh, at some point, he told me, you know what? We're friends now. You don't need to pay me anymore. And uh, that's how we became friends. Kay was in my class. Uh, they started to hang out together, and now they're married. And um, from that, I got a little bit of experience teaching from tutoring people. And Bobby have a subway sketching group in Toronto where I used to go every Sunday when I was in Toronto. And, so what uh, was that? We meet in the subway at a specific spot every Sunday. And to sketch people that are standing there? Yeah, we ride That's the cool. subway and sketch people. And um, we, we go there and help people. So it was another kind of teaching thing for me. I found like uh, teaching was something that really worked for me. I really like teaching, but I never taught I would be a teacher. You know what I mean? That doesn't mm -hmm. sound like an appealing job to me, but I find I love doing art and it's easy for me to uh, explain to people what I do and how I do it and to figure out what they're doing. And um, I used to help people on the subway and I always get really good comments about the way I explain stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, after, as I was in Sheridan, I did, uh, I was supposed to do an internship at a big company, but it didn't work. And Bobby started Imaginism Studios with his, uh, with Kay. And um, he told me, you know, if you don't have an internship, you could do an internship with me. And it was just, uh, when it started, it was Bobby and, and Kay on Bobby's couch. <laughs> so I did my internship with them because I was learning so much with Bobby. and. Um, after that, Kay and I, we were in third year of animation. We never went back to school. Um, we, uh, Bobby and Kay went to uh, some convention in San Diego, and there was a bunch of big studios that wanted us to do uh, work for them. It was, I think, Universal and Valve. And mm -hmm. they, like, we, I was not learning as much as I wanted in school, and I was learning a lot more with Bobby and Kay. So we never went back to school. And at some point after that, I got a teaching opportunity at Humber College for the weekend. So that was my first teaching job. And it was a character design 
class for people that do 3D. And that was my first time I was teaching uh, officially in a school. So you were doing 3D at that point? No, it was character design. I okay, was gotcha, teaching gotcha. character design for people in a 3D program, but they had mm-hmm. a 2D drawing character design class. Cool. No, that's great. And that's really cool. I made friends from that that start coming subway sketching and that are still going subway sketching to this day. So to go into the subway sketching, I mean, I, I really like that because, again, it's um, you're, you're going to have a very high traffic amount of people coming in that you can find the right subjects and, and really get some uh, interesting material to work with. Like, did you ever get any weird looks from people <laughs> as you're going around uh, sketching people and as groups or like, um, what kind of experiences did you have with that? Everyone uh, asked me that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, uh, I think on the subway, you're, you're always very conscious about like people staring at you and it's, it's also very, usually a very, um, lonely stale environment. So when you have like a, a group of people just blatantly <laughs> staring at you with a pen and paper, uh, you know, <laughs> I'd imagine it can be a little bit intrusive. So I was just curious, like, uh, what people were comfortable and what people kind of may have reacted negatively. You know, um, I think it's more in how you do it than exactly what you are doing. So don't look creepy. Is that the the, the secret? (laughs) Exactly. Um, If you look creepy doing pretty much anything, uh, people are going to... Yeah. <laughs> um, I personally never had a bad experience. I heard of people telling me they had bad experience, but I think it's uh, they're not aware of what they're putting out as uh, an image. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, personally, you know, I feel I'm happy when I do it. I smile and I can tell from the corner of my eyes when someone is thinking if I'm sketching them or not. And if I look away, when they look at me to verify if I am, then they just assume that I'm not sketching them and they don't, they're not going to question this again. And then I can just keep drawing them. But Mm. often, you know, as we were talking about Picasso at the beginning, everyone used to draw when they were a kid. So right there, you have a next instant connection that you can have with people. And most people, they usually talk to me and they tell me I used to draw when I was a kid. And I know everyone used to draw when they were a kid. And they, uh, they're they bored. They're in the subway. They're just waiting. you just some entertainment for them. And um, I never had a bad experience. I met people and I made friends and it was just great for me. But I had people that told me the first time they almost got attacked and stuff like that. But I think. Um, The energy you put out, the image, Mm -hmm. if you're just having fun there, just doing your own thing, you're just, they're bored. They're just gonna, they can talk to you and you can uh, make their day. I think it's a good point too. Um, You know, when it comes to the perception of other people, I think that, I think most people, like a majority of people on the planet, just are not aware that they're in complete control of really how people perceive you. And it is about you know, in every moment about being aware of, you know, how you come off, like how you're projecting your, yourself, as well as, you know, being able to, I guess, have that uh, emotional intelligence to be aware when other people are being uncomfortable and how, you know, you react to that, whether you continue to make them more uncomfortable or able, or if you're able to actually diffuse that and, and get someone to be uncomfortable, whether it is to engage them and mention that you're sketching them or just to, as you mentioned, look away. So that way they, start to recalibrate and realize, okay, yeah, there's nothing weird going on. You know, I got all of that, like the kind of subtle communication that people have between each other without ever it being verbal or even, you know, being something that people have eye contact with, like it's also critical. So, um, yeah, I mean, and and again, you saying like, uh, with, you know, looking creepy in any way, I mean, you could look creepy sipping a glass of wine. You can look creepy in any situation. (laughs) And, you know, to me, art is a form of communication. And uh, I find it's really important to uh, be good at communicating because to me, I want people to perceive my art and the characters in it in a certain way. And um, I like to kind of read people in the subway and I can tell when someone's uncomfortable. And the worst that happened to me is that people move from their position, their pose, (laughs) Mm -hmm. so I can draw them anymore. But uh, that's the worst that ever happened to me. But that's actually better for me when they move because I think of them as 3D form. 
and a 3D form is the same in every position. The more they move, the more I'm going to be able to draw them accurately. Mm -hmm. That's great. <laughs> but, but you don't want to push it. You know what I mean? If yeah. you see you're really making someone uncomfortable, you, you, it's, it's kind of being aggressive and a little bit of an absolutely. Issue. Well, yeah, because I mean, it, it is a bit invasive. I, I personally don't think if, if I were at the subway and someone mentioned they were drawing me, I think that me personally, that would make me uncomfortable. Like someone taking a photo of you is one thing because it's that one moment. But when it's a continuous thing, then it's, it's kind of like every action I do is essentially being interpreted. So yeah, it's, you know, it's definitely a different mindset. And that's why I, I, I love the idea of you guys getting together as groups and, and doing this anyway, just because I think a subway is a, a place that you are going to get that, as I mentioned, yeah. high amount of traffic uh, coming in. So you're going to find the right subjects and rather than kind of being stuck with like, let's say doing life drawing, you're stuck with one person and whether they're interesting or not, um, you know, it, it really, you know, there's yeah, not too much you can do with it. We're not there to harass people. We're there to have fun. And uh, to me, it's been a great experience. And the subway is catching for me as opposed to a, a paid model in a class. It's like going to the zoo for people. You see mm -hmm. people in their natural environment, not posing. And I think that's, the, that's where you get the best characters. That's great. And it just, doesn't need to be subway, you know? It could yeah. be any public place, but subway, it's like they're stuck there with you. <laughs> you can't run <laughs> so just to jump around a little bit and then i want to kind of fast forward a little bit to um to schoolism but um again going back to sheridan i mean when you first applied there and you got that rejection i mean for you did you see that as as a challenge like okay um you know i'm not getting the acceptance i wanted so therefore i gotta try harder did you dive into it more like try and figure out like well what were the reasons behind it or like how did you handle that rejection in that moment to me, it was just uh, challenging me. I was like, that's not how it's going to go. And I went there and um, I started working really hard. And uh, I, uh, I got in after uh, easily. And uh, I was kind of uh, at this reputation about doing good life drawing. So I was kind of the life drawing guy. And um, I got kind of uh, known for the live drawing so I had to keep that going so while I was in animation I used to go to live drawing like every day again and after um, as I was doing subway sketching after I taught to Humber College um, Bobby used to teach live drawing at Sheridan and uh, he wanted to stop and they asked him if he knew someone that could replace him and uh, that was about six months after I dropped out from the program and he told me, uh, he told them that I could replace him. And I, I knew the dean a little bit from talking with her. And I knew the live drawing coordinator. And they were like, do you think you can do it? And Bobby said, absolutely. So uh, a few months after I dropped out from that school, I was a third year live drawing teacher in Sheridan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was great. All the tutoring, the subway sketching, it really helped. And uh, it was a great experience. And that was my first uh, real serious um, teaching job. And to me, I found that my passion was uh, to do art. And, you know, I was telling you before that I like studying different things and I always change my mind. So when I found art for me, it was the perfect thing. Because if I like boats one day, I can study boats, I can draw boats, I can paint boats. And if I'm bored of boats and I like trees, then I can mm -hmm. study trees or any other subject that I like. So for me, art was a never-ending learning experience where I could jump from subject to subject without changing job. And to tell you another quote from Picasso, he said, the meaning of life is to find your gift and the purpose of life is to give it away. I love it. So to me, teaching and art is the meaning of my life. And to be able to teach that and to give those skills to other people, that's the purpose of my life. And I really found myself through that. But it took me years. I studied until in officially. I still study all the time. But I studied in college officially until I was 28. And I really started drawing when I was 24. So it's never too late to start. And I kept searching for myself for years. 
and I never gave up. And I really feel that I have found my passion, which is learning and teaching. Cool. That's amazing. I love it. And um, a couple other questions I had was just more when you moved from North Quebec to Toronto, like to um, a place that, you know, most people study English in, in Canada when they're growing up, uh, sorry, uh, French, but um, for you, what was it like to, um, to go into an environment that wasn't naturally speaking the language that you were used to? I mean, how intimidating was it? Do you think it's something that, I, I think that a lot of people, they're afraid maybe to go work in another country because um, they don't speak the language and there'll be a, a huge disconnect when I figure if anything, it's, it's, a, it's a new opportunity. It's a chance to experience something. Uh, and again, to be humbled by the fact that, you know, you aren't natively able to walk in and, and just be who you are. You've got to build uh, your way back to um, to the things that we take for granted. So for you, like, what was it challenging? Was it discouraging? Was it scary? What was it like? It was terrifying. It was really hard, but it was a nice kind of challenge and adventure. And you know, when I studied, when I was in high school, at some point I changed school and I live in residence for six months. So that was a kind of brand new experience. When I studied film, I also was living away from home in a residence. So going there uh, to study in a place that speak a different language, it was an adventure and uh, it was challenging. It was hard. The essay writing class were really hard because <laughs> I learned to speak English from hearing it. So all the mistake, the spelling mistake. Yeah, especially um, American English to Canadian English as well. <laughs> but it was in Canada. It was in Canada. Well, actually, sorry, I guess that's the good point is that um, at, at least, uh, let's say Canadian, like UK English is a lot more similar to French than American. Well, yeah, than American English is at least. So uh, at least there's, there's not as many um, issues there than if you were to come to the US where the words have kind of changed quite a lot in terms of spelling and, and things like that. I find a, a good way that, a good reason why I passed those essay writing class was communication. Um, I use most people in the animation program, they didn't really care about the essay writing classes. So the teacher, they didn't like animation students because they didn't go to class and they really didn't care about the subject. So my trick to pass those class was at the beginning of the class, I was going to see the teacher and I was telling them, listen, um, I can't write English, but I'm going to be a great student. I'm going to be to class every time. I'm going to participate. I'm going to give my hundred person here. So if you could like, you know, give mm -hmm. me a break or, you know, just uh, be aware of my situation, then that'd be great. And then they start the year by liking you and you keep that. You're pretty much the only person going to class at a certain point. <laughs> I like so that. when they correct your essays, they're like, you know, you've been trying really hard. So I, that plays a little part in how they're not going to hate you and be like, mm -hmm. who's this? I've never seen that person the whole year. You're no, that person I think that it's good. Participate. You're able to set up that expectation early on. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I think it's good. And for you, like, uh, just to jump forward a bit, because I'd love to talk about the uh, the stuff we were talking about before we started the call in terms of schoolism. But yes. um, yeah, I mean, when Bobby first officially started schoolism, is that when you came on board? And um, yeah, like, what was it like in the beginning, obviously starting very small and having to grow? Um, I used to live with Bobby before schoolism. I used to live with Bobby and Kay, and um, I used to sleep on Bobby's floor. And Bobby... He wouldn't was... even give you a couch? <laughs> <laughs> well, I never slept on a couch, but uh, <laughs> it, was, it was, you know, I was there to learn. Mm -hmm. And Bobby was uh, an amazing uh, tutor for me, and he just took me under his wing and told me that all I needed to do is to learn, and uh, I wouldn't need to worry about the food or living expenses and stuff like that. And I was helping him with a bunch of stuff. And then we started schoolism as our version of the perfect school because our passion is learning. So um, we started from scratch in uh, Bobby's living room and we got a programmer and then we just tried to figure out what to do by ourselves. And um, it was uh, a little bit after I kind of joined uh, Imaginism 
and we started Schoolism, which is our perfect version of the perfect school. And we love to learn, so we got all these amazing teachers on board that don't have time to uh, teach, but because of the way Schoolism is made, someone very busy doing a full-time job can uh, teach on Schoolism. And you want to learn not from people that their full-time job is to be a teacher, but their full-time job is to be an artist. Mm -hmm. And um, that's how we started Schoolism. And then I, a little bit after that, um, Bobby is a great thinker. And he was thinking, you know what? He loves teaching. And um, we had this location opportunity. And uh, we... We came up with the workshop concept where it would be like schoolism, but a live version that would be 30 days and that people would actually move in with us. And the point of schoolism is to recreate that experience that we first had when we uh, started Imaginism, where we used to all live together and um, learn from each other. And there was no distraction. It was art from the time you get up to the time you go to bed. So this is the most, I think, rewarding and uh, interesting thing that I'm doing right now is that I'm living my dream, which is to do art all the time and to meet people from around the world, to meet artists from around the world. So the Schoolism House that we do right now, uh, we choose four students that we handpick, we do uh, applications, Skype interviews, and then they move in into my house, which is in St. Julien, which is in the province of Quebec. And they move in with me for 30 days and we could recreate for them the experience of how we started Imaginism. So we live together, uh, we eat together, we draw and paint from the time they get up to the time they go to bed. They get feedback, they get lessons, we do art exercise together, they do homework, they see me work on children's book and movies at night. And um, the house is beautiful, it's situated uh, by a lake, there's a beach in the backyard, it's surrounded by nature. It's um, everyone has their own bedroom, their own private washroom. We have internet. It's in the country, but it's beautiful. I don't know if you know what a sugar shack is, Alan. Mm, no, I know what Shake Shack is, but no, I don't. <laughs> uh, so what, what is a sugar shack? It's the place where they make maple syrup. Mm -hmm. So there's which, uh, which Quebec is very famous for. Yes. And the area where the Schoolism House is, is the Sugar Shack area. There's about a hundred around here. It's a barn and the sap flows through the maple trees about 10 days a year. And you can go have uh, lunch or dinner there during that time. It's in the spring, between the winter and the spring. And um, it's, uh, it's beautiful. There's some, so much wildlife around here. There's some geese. There's about 3,000 geese on the lake before winter and at the end of winter. There's deers that come around. There's some foxes, all sorts of stuff. Is there the any subways? Also, <laughs> there's no subways. It's in the country. <laughs> I know. I'm just stirring. But no, it sounds beautiful. Yeah. And uh, basically, not only... Um, I get to meet people from around the world, artists from around the world and help them. But every month I get a guest artist to come and visit me and spend a few days at the Schoolism House. I got amazing artists like Nathan Fox, I know Nathan. Armand Balthazar, Bobby's come around once in a while, Jason Seiler, Steven Silver, and they, they come and spend a few days with us. So the student get to not only get a workshop from them, but they get to have dinner with them and we play games, we have fun and they become friends. So to me, um, I'm really living my dream. I teach, I do art and I get my favorite artists in the world to come and hang out with me for a few days and I learn from them. And it's, uh, it's, I'm really living what, uh, beyond my wildest dream. I just learn all the time. I draw and paint and I don't travel, but I get people from around the world yeah. to come and travel to my house. No, and I love that. I love the fact that that came from kind of the success 
of the experience that you had uh, in the very beginning with Bobby and getting to kind of replicate what was working already. And uh, on top of that, just, you know, I, I feel like when you really want to learn something, the, the best way to do it is total immersion. In other words, to fully immerse yourself and to live it while you're going through it. And for, for you and all of your students, it sounds like that's exactly like literally what they're doing. They're going and living with you and getting to, um, to go through 30 days of, of that experience. It's kind of like if you want to learn a new language or if you want to learn a new subject, it's better to live in that country or to go and work in that subject because doing it every day and, and going through it and, and learning from the people around you, people that are better than you, people who are maybe struggling more than you and seeing how they handle everything, it makes you able to learn better and to be stronger in what you're doing. So I think it's really amazing to kind of have that environment. And yeah, obviously it's very different to anything else out there. And a great thing about it too, is that they don't have any distractions Mm. because they're far away from home and it's totally immersive nonstop. They come out of there, they come out of here. um, They see things different. They see life different, not only art, they think different and they draw and they paint completely different. Most people told me that it's the most amazing experience they had in their entire life. And you can ask any of my students, any of my past students, how I was, and I'm not afraid that they're going to tell you (laughs) wonderful things. That's so cool. That's really cool. And I guess, um, yeah, I mean, for for a lot of the students like what has then been their experience afterwards like do a lot of people tend to go in and do like a 30 days uh you know when they're already more like more mid-level and they're looking to get into the industry and and really level up their skills like what are typically the experiences people have after going through 30 days of literally living and breathing art the 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 workshop is open to people of all levels so i get people that are beginner i got people that are totally professionals. It doesn't matter. I teach in a very unique way. And uh, we go from very simple stuff to very complex stuff. And you know, art is a never ending experience. And um, I teach them a lot, a different way to see the world and art. And it opens them to be a lot more receptive to other stuff they're gonna be learning afterwards i got a lot of people telling me that um if they do schoolism classes afterwards or other courses they they understand stuff on a totally different level um i teach them a very universal way of learning and very uh universal principle that they can use on different things um people they uh after they just keep learning this is kind of uh everyone come out of their change and people it's like giving them kind of a swing and then they just keep going towards um what they want to do no that's great that's really cool and what are um what is like the typical process let's say you know getting up in the morning you have your cereal and then do a, a drawing of the um the, the bird on the cereal box or how's it work? <laughs> so a typical day at the schoolism house is that um, every day people have homework and their homework are due at 10 in the morning. So in the morning, starting at 10, I, I do feedback for them. And uh, I go into over everyone's homework. And the luxury of having only four students is that I can really get to know them on a personal level. I can understand how they're thinking individually and I can help everyone uh, personally uh, to get better and to the next level. So I I give them feedback every day. Uh, Then we have lunch. After that, I teach them a lesson. So I broke down how I do things into 30 lessons. And um, you know, sometimes you go to a workshop, you learn amazing things, you understand everything they're talking about, and then you go home and you try Mm -hmm. it and you cannot do any of it. The luxury that I have to spend 30 days with them is that I can make sure they can do everything. So every day I teach them a lesson. And then after that, I design some exercise to make sure that um, they can do what I just taught them. And as they do those exercises, I'm beside them, I walk around and I help everyone individually. And after that, I give them a homework to make sure they assimilated everything from the lesson. And their homework is due at, ne- at 10 the next morning. 
So if people like to work late and get up a little later, that works. If they like to uh, go to bed early and get up early and work on their homework, it works for them as well. So that's how a typical day goes. After the lesson and exercise, we have dinner, people cook together. It's really amazing uh, bonding in the kitchen. You try dish from around the world. And after that, they work on their homework till they go to bed, which is due the next morning. And mm -hmm. on Fridays, I cook for the students. So I invite them in my part of the schoolism house. And then I make them a nice home-cooked dinner. We play some board games, sometimes some video games. Sometimes we watch movies. It depends on the group. Everyone is a little different. So we find a good dynamic that works with the group. And uh, on the weekend, it's a little bit more relaxed, but we still have homework to do. And there's a mini lesson sometime. And we do some mini field trip where we go to some local uh, store and attraction around. And um, it's so, so much fun. It's very hard. It's very mm. challenging. It's hard, but it's a lot more fun than it's hard. And it's, we have such a great time that it passed so fast. It feels actually like it's speeding up. It feels mm -hmm. like a week, even though it's a month. Right. No, I love it. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's so cool. Like Bobby originally told me about it, and I thought it was such a, a, a different experience to what you might experience when you're going into a class where there's 60 people. And, you know, again, like uh, if the tutors are just there to clock in, clock out, uh, when you have someone who is literally giving their time um, day and night to, to making sure that, you know, a, a set amount of people get it and uh, are able to really absorb as much as they can, you know, give them that attention. I think that's really cool. It's a very unique experience and opportunity. And it's an experience that stay with you for the rest of your life. And I'm just curious for people who, who go on, and, and this is more of a general question, but, um, you know, I always find with doing more conceptual work, like doing more traditional art and digital design, it's obviously a very competitive industry to be in. And um, at the same time, like, do you have any advice for people who want to stand out, who want to uh, be able to go out into the real world and be able to get their dream jobs, knowing that there are so many other people out there um, doing what they do and trying to make sure that their ability and their artwork is, you know, able to get noticed? You know, I find um, the best skills that you can have is creativity. Um, you know, way back, there was not a lot of people that could render stuff. But now, nowadays, uh, the knowledge is there on the internet and uh, be able to find people that can render stuff really well, it's, it's not that hard. But to find people that have good ideas, that's a lot harder to find. Mm -hmm. So I feel you need the technical aspect, but you need um, the creativity, which is, uh, it comes from, you know, exploring the world, um, being inspired, and um, it's important, I feel, I work really hard, but I take time also to do little things besides it. Um, I'm lucky enough to get people from around the world to visit me. So I would say hanging out with your friends is a really good source of inspiration. I, mm -hmm. I'm lucky enough that my work is kind of hanging out with my friends in a way. Mm -hmm. And I get awesome artists from around the world to come and hang out with me every month. And I feel I get a lot of ideas from that. And I also hang out with my niece and my nephew that are four years old and a year and a half. And I get so many cool ideas from them. And I feel that knowing how to, if we compare uh, rendering and doing art and creativity to something more familiar like writing, if you, you know, Everyone can learn how to write, but not everyone can uh, write interesting books or beautiful poetry. And right. if you can write interesting stuff, sometimes it, it's less important. <laughs> I'm not saying you should not focus on the technical skill, but when something is really interesting, it doesn't really matter if uh, the people have an accent or if they don't have the most beautiful writing in the world. The content is really important. Good ideas is hard to find. And no matter how well you can write or render stuff and paint and draw, if you don't have good ideas, then uh, it's mm. not as interesting. Otherwise, you're a button pusher in a lot of ways. No, I think that's good. 
And apparently uh, you tend to work a lot with boxes. I was reading somewhere. <laughs> you know, um, I think I got, Bobby taught me how to draw with boxes when I was a student, like probably the second time I met Bobby. And it really stuck with me. And I've been thinking about it and I'm obsessed with it. And I think I can, I change my student life by making them see that everything's a box. Mm -hmm. Because a cube is the most simple 3D object there is. Yeah. And every object in our universe is 3D. So if you really understand the essence of a cube, what really is at the core of a cube, then you can understand every single object in the world. And I think that if you learn to draw a cube in its essence, there's absolutely nothing in the world you cannot draw. And that's what I teach to my students in the workshop. It's a Dude. little bit like the matrix, but the cube <laughs> once version. you see it, no, I, I think yeah. it's awesome. Um, there's a book that I found at like a, at a, a thrift store or an, I think we call it an op shop in Australia. Um, but yeah, basically uh, it was like this cheap secondhand book. I, I didn't think it even had the cover still attached, but I end up finding it years later. And a lot of my animator friends have referenced it as well, but um, it really broke down a lot of uh, traditional uh, facial expressions and character poses, but there was a lot to do with more complex anatomy, which was hands and, and body parts and everything was just broken down to boxes. And I was only, I think eight or nine at the time, but like just seeing it, with that perspective, it, it definitely made everything, the shapes of everything kind of come together a lot more. It just made more sense than seeing everything as complex as it is, seeing it more in terms of the proportions and the, the posing um, of, of everyone and what they're doing. And yeah, I, I think that, you know, it's not something that I've followed and I'm definitely not uh, a great drawer these days, but I definitely started out like pursuing that kind of um, uh, art form. And yeah, but like just kind of looking at that in that way, it definitely brought a lot of clarity to, you know, the process of, of breaking down complex shapes into something that you can understand and, and then create yourself. Yeah. It's a uh, boxes changed my life. And uh, I teach that to my students. And after a few weeks, after a few days, they, they start seeing it everywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, that's great. <laughs> Um, definitely change your, your outlook on things a lot. Um, no, that's cool. And just curious, I mean, as we're recording this, it is the, the very beginning of, um, of 2018. Like, do you have any big goals for this year? Or is it more just continue doing, um, all the, the great work that you guys are doing? Um, I got a lot of, uh, stuff about the workshop plan. Um, I got a personal goal that I'm working on is, uh, I'm uh, kind of writing my own uh, children's book. Great. And it's, uh, it's a new challenge. That was a long goal that I had from a long time ago. But before I tackled my own, I wanted to illustrate children's book for other companies to learn how they do it. And now mm -hmm. uh, I, I started working on it. And that's uh, what I'm working on uh, this year. And also I do some fun personal projects. Uh, I'm not going to tell you details about it, but I'm just going to tell you that um, a good way to um, get jobs is to create imaginary jobs for yourself. So if I want to work on children's book, I, I would, let's say I want to do children's book covers. I would take a bunch of different titles of children's book that I like. For example, I could take Lord of the Ring and imagine that I'm doing a cover for Lord of the Rings and just do what I would do for a cover in my style of Lord of the Rings. If I want to do illustration for inside a children's book, I could illustrate a book, do a few illustrations for a book that I love. And mm -hmm. if I want to work more on movies, I could imagine um, that I'm working for a movie that doesn't really exist. For example, I would choose one of my fi favorite directors and make uh, an imaginary movie about it and do concepts about it. And it makes great portfolio pieces and it practice you and uh, it yeah. attracts client. And who knows what could come out of that? Well, I look at Neil Blomkamp when, you know, he uh, was shooting Chappie, he ended up teaming up with Sigourney Weaver and just chatting away about, you know, the what if we ever did an alien ourselves, would it be so cool? And, and just hiring an amazing, uh, I can't remember his name, but concept artist and just knocking out some cool concepts of 
if they own the rights to to alien what would they do but you know then obviously putting it online and letting other people kind of go bat for them you know but you're right just kind of like um entertaining ideas that the what ifs of yeah I would, i'd love to do this well why why don't i just go do it and eventually um you know hopefully i'll get to do it for other people you know and yeah. i think that with with art and everything else i think it all starts there you need to build that portfolio and you need to learn and practice you can't just wait until you get paid to do it before you go off and do it and i think that a lot of i have met a lot of people over time that they have that mindset of like i want to go do this but they're not going to go and do it until someone hires them and no one's going to hire them until they can actually prove they can do it um so you need to be able to kind of step back and and just start having fun with it you know like learn to love it and let all the other stuff fall into place absolutely don't wait for people to tell you you're a concept artist yeah to be a concept artist just do it on your own yeah i had someone ask me a few months ago one of my students he said you know am i allowed to i, I thought it was a really interesting thing like he he wanted to put on his linkedin like he's a technical director but he he wanted to know whether or not he can say he's a technical director or whether or not he has to wait until he is a technical director you know and i think it's one of those things that you don't ask permission to be something you you decide to do it and you start doing it uh you know there there's obviously things like being a supervisor or or certain things that you know you get knighted into it you know you need someone to um to say like hey yeah you're you're officially now doing this thing but when you want to be something i think the first step is to to give yourself permission and then everything else falls into place you know no no one if you go to someone and and you want to be an artist and you can't call yourself an artist yet there's no way that they're going to hire you as an artist if you were not able to even identify yourself as one so i think it's Absolutely. it's the first step it's That's like cool. going when you graduate going and say like you're a student still you know what mm-hmm. i mean yeah you rather yeah. have a concept artist to do stuff for you than to have a student that's right that's exactly right and i think we're all students <laughs> in the end anyway so uh and just just to end this um but uh if what would be two bottles of red that you would recommend that $20 price range and $100 price range. <laughs> um, what country are you in? I'm in uh Oregon right now, so I'm just up north from California. Okay. There's a great uh Portuguese wine called uh, Duo Rum, D U O R U M, which is uh I had friends in the US that bought it. Mm-hmm. It's uh I think it's 15 to $20. I think it's more 15. It is great. Uh my dad discovered this wine years ago. He was the first one to import this in Quebec. And my uh challenge when I used to be a wine advisor, which I was for 10 years before I became an artist, was to always find the best wine between 15 and $20. Mm-hmm. So I love Portuguese wine from the Douro region. This one is called Duo Rum. It's amazing. And were you saying a $100 price yep. range as well? That's yep. uh, Hmm. You know, I don't buy a lot of wine at that price range, but mm-hmm. you know uh Francis Ford Coppola? Of course. He, see his bottles every wine? time. Yeah, I've been to his vineyard. His, it's in uh, director's cut is unbelievable. Yeah, no, it's great. Uh he's up in Santa Barbara. It's um or well, I should say down. Now I keep thinking I'm still in LA. Uh <laughs> yeah, he's down in Santa Barbara. But um yeah, the director's cut's a great bottle. I love that one. It's $30, I think. And uh I usually stay in those range. And I think that's a good point too because the reason I ask between a $20 and a $100 is that I think a $100 bottle is a a great gift especially if um you know you you want to give something that someone can have a a good price value on um but at the same time like I I'm I think my palate is you know definitely matured over the years but I still remember I think I might have been like 21 and I it was new year's day and I went to my friend's place we bought a, bo- a two bottles of wine on the way they bought a $20 bottle of wine and I bought a $120 bottle of wine and I couldn't tell the difference at the time you know what I mean and um I think it you know most bottles you're not really unless you are a sommelier and can have that um that palate that you can distinguish them you know I think that all of us are going to hit our cap um somewhere between uh, 15 to 30 so yeah I mean my favorite um I love a lot of Cabernet Sauvignon but I think it's uh, uh Justin for white and a Prisoner is definitely my favorite red but okay. they're they're more about $45 but again um you know usually a 20 or $25 bottle of you know um let's say a northern california wine or something like that is is 
definitely um, my, my go-to usually. But like I said, I think it's good sometimes just to know a few good ones that are good gifts to kind of pass on when uh, you want to celebrate something and give someone something that they can treasure and put on their, their shelf. In my opinion, a $100 bottle of wine is not five times better than a $20 no. bottle of wine. It's $100 just as a gift give, coupon, basically. <laughs> I'd rather give five $20 bottle of wine to the person. And if they, they, are, they have a wine cellar and stuff, mm-hmm. if you get five $20 ones, you can taste one, put the four in your cellar, wait a few years, try again, and see when you like it the most, and then drink the rest. That's right. No, that's good. And, and now I have someone I can pick their brain if I'm ever um, wondering what bottle to pick up for someone. So I'll, I'll definitely keep you on my, my speed dial. Sure, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, if you're right on my head like this, uh, I don't often buy a $100 bottle of wine. Mm-hmm. But uh, if you send me an email to get a list, I can make you a list with a bunch of wines uh, from different price, price range. Mm. I think I, I bought more bottles of wine as Christmas gifts this year than I did anything else. Because again, again I think it's something that, um, you know, for me, when I think of wine, it's either, in fact, uh, right after this call, I'm going to be cracking up a bottle. But uh, yeah, I mean, in general, I think it's just always a good celebratory thing that you can bring to someone's house or you can give to someone and say, you know, let's open it up next time I visit, you know, and it's, it's just a, a really good symbolic gift that is, um, it doesn't need to be too personal, but at the same time, it's something that, uh, yeah, you can put a lot of thought into. So yeah, um, I think it's the, the gift that always keeps on giving. <laughs> and that's totally cool. With you. But uh, again, like, it's been really great to, uh, to chat and um, yeah, uh, I appreciate you taking the time out. You're very welcome. Thank you for thinking of me. It's uh, an honor to be part of your podcast. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that episode. So plenty more great stuff coming up. Again, I want to thank Thierry for taking the time out to chat. Um, I had a blast chatting to him. I had a blast chatting with Bobby recently as well in the in the previous episode. I've got the other half of Bobby's episode coming up in a few weeks time because we kind of broke it up a little bit just because we chatted about so much great stuff. Uh, and in fact, that's exactly what happened with Kat Evans. We talked about uh, women in visual effects and Kat and I talked about a lot of stuff. It was a very long conversation. Um, so we're actually going to be doing another episode with Kat next episode. So episode 132, um, Kat's going to be back talking about leaving visual effects. And I think this is going to be a really interesting subject because no one ever talks about this. We're always talking about how to get in. And then we're talking about, um, how to make the most of your time in there. But what if you've been in the industry like Kat for 15 years working at ILM, Tippett, and all these other big studios on such amazingly big movies? Um, just recently, I'm glad that it's now public. Um, her husband, Neil Blevins, also has just resigned from Pixar, where he's been for, I think, 12 or 13 years. And um, yeah, so both of them have decided to not necessarily both leave visual effects, but definitely make some big changes. And Kat is leaving visual effects after spending uh, 13 years uh, working in the industry. So um, we talk about that and just essentially kind of the the lifetime, I guess, is one way to put it, of uh, a visual effects artist. And uh, again, she's got so much knowledge on the subject and many others that we get into. So uh, it's, I think, really insightful. And it might kind of give you some ideas too, is like, hey, you know what? I'm killing myself right now and I'm working really hard, but what's my end game? You know, what do I want to be doing this when I'm 40? Do I want to be doing it when I'm 50? Am I able to be doing this when I'm 50 or 60? Um, obviously, visual effects is very demanding on our time, our health, and a lot of other things. So um, that is something that I think is really worth us kind of spending some time focusing on, not just the sexy part of how to make money and how to get in there and, you know, all those other things, but also about the long run, like what's your end game? So this is going to be cool. Check out episode 132 with Kat. Like I said, I've got some really killer episodes coming up. Um, I'm going to actually be hanging out with the guys from Unit Image, which we did an episode a while back, episode 115. So if you go to alanmckay.com slash 115, you can check out the episode uh, with them. I'm going to be hanging out with them next week, I guess. Um, So that's going to be really cool to go by their office and check it all out, see some of the amazing work they're doing, have some drinks. I'm also organizing drinks with everyone inside of my mentorship as well. Uh, So that's going to be really cool for everyone who's flying in to the event. We're all going to hang out the day before and get together. So that's going to be really cool as well. All right. So 
that is it for now. I'm going to be back next week with episode 132 with Kat Evans. Until then, rock on.